All right, hello everybody, and welcome to the second lecture in the chapter chapter 18 sequence. So we're going to be following up on aqueous ionic equilibrium. In the last chapter or last lecture, we talked about buffers primarily, and we're going to wrap up the chapter by discussing uh, titrations of buffers specifically, and also look at how uh, aqueous ionic equilibrium affects solubility. So that said, let's jump into it. So like I said, we're going to start off talking about titrations. Uh, so what is a titration? Well, we're going to start with acid-base titrations. There's all kinds of subcategories of titrations. But in an acid-base titration, a solution uh, which is of unknown concentration, which we call the titrant, is slowly added to a solution of known concentration until there's some kind of um, completion to the reaction. So this is general definition. So uh, in an acid-base titration, when the moles of an acid are equal to the moles of the base, and we've reached full neutralization of the acid-base reaction because of this equivalence, uh, the titrations reach what we call an equivalence point. And sometimes this is done with an indicator, a, a colorimetric dye indicator. And sometimes it's done by actually looking at the pH directly using a pH probe in the solution as we slowly add uh, the known to the unknown. So I know that sounds a little abstract, but this is what it kind of looks like. Uh, in this particular case, we have pictured a burette on top, which has a little knob which you can turn and slowly, incrementally add a solution of known quantity um, or unknown quantity, because we could have no, the known or unknown being either, um, to the other quantity. And in this particular case, we have a solution in our Erlenmeyer flask on the bottom here, which has acid in it. And we're adding base to this uh, from the burette incrementally. And we keep adding it very slowly until we reach a colorimetric equivalence point when the solution becomes neutral. And what's important here is we know where our starting point is, and we know where our end point is. And these uh, glassware are calibrated so we can record the volume that's delivered um, from, from the delta between our initial and final position of the meniscus. Now what's cool about this is because we know what reactions taking place in acid-base titration, we can take the volume that's been delivered and we can calculate the amount of hydroxide that, that was delivered, which was required to reach equivalence. And that amount of hydroxide is going to tell us, based on the reaction that's taking place, how much acid was in the solution to begin with. And once we know that, we can calculate the concentration of that acid or the pH of that acid, or the acidic solution, excuse me. So. Based on that summary, let's jump into uh, titrations and titration curves. So what a titration curve is, is it's a plot of the pH versus the amount of added titrant. Um, and what does that look like? I'm going to go back and forth a few times here. This is a pH titration curve of a strong base being added to a strong acid. So very simple. Um, strong base, strong acid titration. And you can see on the x-axis, we have the volume of sodium hydroxide that's being added in milliliters. And this can be volume of sodium hydroxide added, or it can be any number of different values. But it's basically the amount of titrant added versus what's happening to the pH of the solution to which we're adding the titrant. So the inflection point, you notice, it's not linear. Come over here, we have this S-curve. And this is the inflection point. And the inflection point is the point at which the magnitude of the slope, or the sign of the slope, starts to change. 
if you were taking a derivative of the slope. So the inflection point of the curve is the equivalent point of the titration. So at the point where the rate starts to slow down, we're going faster, 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 and then it starts to slow down, slow down, slow down. So right here at our inflection point of the curve, or the middle of that S, is also our equivalent, which happens at pH 7. That's the point at which we stop speeding up and we start slowing down and hitting the brakes on it again. Oh, sorry, keep pushing the wrong button. So prior to this equivalence point that we were just looking at, the original solution in the flask is in excess, so the pH is closest uh, to its pH. And the pH of the equivalence point depends on the pH of the salt solution. So what's that mean? Well, the equivalence point of a neutral salt is going to be 7. The equivalent point of an acidic salt is going to be less than 7. And if it's basic salt, it's going to be greater than 7. So let's take a look at this one more time. Kind of get comfortable with it. This is, once again, our strong base in hydroxide being added to a strong acid of some kind. And this is what a titration of a strong base with a strong acid would look like. Notice that we start with high pH before we've added any hydrochloric acid because we're in that 13 zone. And now we start adding in hydrochloric acid incrementally and the pH is dropping slowly, 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 and then it starts to really descend quickly. And then we hit neutral at, in this case, about 25 milliliters of hydrochloric acid added. And it starts to slow down, but still moving quickly. And then as we hit a pH of about oh, 2.3 or so, it starts to decelerate and starts to taper off a little bit. So let's look at this from a problem-solving standpoint because nearly everything with the titration that you're interested in involves doing some degree of calculation so that we can abstract the information that we're interested in from that titration. So let's do a quick problem involving a strong acid, strong base titration. In this particular example, we have a 50 milliliter, 50.0 milliliter sample of 0 0.200 moles per liter sodium hydroxide and it's being titrated with 0 0.200 moles per liter nitric acid. And what we want to do is calculate the pH after A, adding 30.00 milliliters of nitric acid, and B, at the equivalence points. So we have two different things that we're trying to ascertain from this problem. So first off, whenever you have something like this, and you have a volume, and you have a concentration of moles per unit volume, like we do with this one, you know right away you're going to be interested at some point in moles, right? That's going to be the first hint right out the gate whenever you see this combination of things. So let's start with A. What's going to happen after adding 30.00 milliliters of nitric acid, which is a strong acid? So we're going to begin by calculating the initial amount of sodium hydroxide in moles, like we just talked about, from that volume of 0 0.200 moles per liter hydroxide solution. Um, and we know it's a strong base, so it's going to fully dissociate. We don't have to worry about any equilibrium associated with that dissociation. So let's just jump right in. 50 milliliters is 0 0.050 liters. At this point, you guys are probably able to do that in your head because we've been doing it since Chem 105. Um, if you need to use a little bit of uh, math to make that comfortable, you're welcome to. But it's 0 0.0500 liters, and we're going to multiply that by 0 0.200 moles per liter. Notice that we have liters on top and then moles per liter, so liters is on the bottom, liters will cancel, leaving us our target with moles of hydroxide. So we're going to end up with 0 0.0100 moles of hydroxide ions in solution. So from here, we need to calculate the amount of nitric acid in moles, which has been added from 30.0 milliliters, uh, to see what we're going to be at um, in terms of pH. We need to know how much acid was added to that base to get to a final value. So for this, 
we know that the concentration of the nitric acid is 0 0.200 moles per liter, and we know that we have 30.00 milliliters of it. 30 mils is 0 0.0300 liters times 0.2 moles per liter. Liters are going to cancel, giving us moles of the final product, 0 0.00600 moles of nitric acid. So right out the gate, we know that we started with 0 0.010 moles of hydroxide and we have 0 0.006 moles of nitric acid therefore we're going to have a molar excess of hydroxide keep that in mind so um, we've added been adding this nitric acid to the solution it's neutralizing some of the hydroxide however it's not all used up we're going to end up with 0 0.0040 moles of hydroxide after the reaction's done. Now this is a nice, it seems intuitive, but here we have a 1, 2, 1, 2, 2 reaction. This of course doesn't play in because it's a liquid, so it's not involving any equilibrium, but uh, it, when you're dealing with polyprotic acids, this is good habit to be in. So now that we know the amount of hydroxide remaining, What do we need to do? Well, we've changed the volume of solution, right? Because initially we had 0.05 liters of solution, and then we added another 0.03 liters of nitric acid solution. So our new concentration is going to be uh, 0.08 liters of solution. So our concentration of hydroxide in solution and it's final, uh, finally the titration is going to be determined by dividing the amount of moles of hydroxide left over by the total volume, which is going to be 0 0.0500 moles per liter. Uh, from here, now that we have the concentration of hydroxide, you can calculate the pOH effortlessly. P uh, pOH is just like pH. It's the negative log of the concentration of hydroxide, though, instead of the negative log of the concentration of protons. So pOH is negative log of 0.05, which is 1.3. If you want pH now, you just use the relationship that pH plus pOH equals 14. So from here, we can just say pH is 14 minus pOH, which is 14 minus 1.3. So the pH of this solution is going to be 12.70. Not hard. So the question, of course, then is part B. Let me go back one. Question B is, what's the pH at the equivalence point? Well, the pH at the equivalence point is probably going to be 7 <laughs> because these are, these are uh, neutral salts. So at the equivalence point, the strong base has completely neutralized the acid, and um, pH is going to be 7. So seems like it would be harder because it's part B, but in fact it's not. It's very straightforward. So what I'd recommend now that we've worked through this once is do the exact same process for this problem here, um, but just change the values a little bit and see if you can work through it from scratch without uh, too much guidance. That'll really help drive that long-term potentiation, get everything clicking and make sure that you're solid with this before we start adding more complexity. So, now that you've done that, hypothetically, let's talk about titrating of a weak acid with a strong base. So before we had a strong acid and a strong base, both fully dissociate. Now we're going to look at a weak acid and a strong base. So how does this differ? Well, titrating a weak acid and a strong base results in differences in the titration curve um, than what we saw before. Specifically, where we have excess acid and at the equivalence point. So the initial pH is determined using the Ka of the weak acid. First difference. Dealing with Ka's now because we're dealing with equilibria of weak acids. The pH in the excess region is going to be determined as you would normally determine pH of a buffer. The pH at the equivalent point is going to be determined using Kb of the conjugate base of the weak acid, 
And finally, the pH of the equivalents is going to be dominated by the excess strong base um, because the conjugate base is, uh, basicity is negligible compared to that of the strong base. So what's this look like? Well, this is what it looks like here. Uh, here we have a classic titration of a weak acid with a strong base. And what we have here, as we start to add hydroxide, is we have a buffering region. You even see that being referred to as a buffering range. Um, and that is because as we're adding hydroxide to a weak acid, you are pulling the proton off the acid and producing the conjugate base, which as you do more and more, starts to produce a buffer. By reacting the weak acid with the strong base, you're actually creating a buffering system. And you don't chain get to the um, equivalence point, which is the weak conjugate base, until you've completely consumed that weak acid. So it's a little bit different than what we were looking at before. So when you're looking at this kind of uh, titration curve, remember, at the beginning, we have the initial pH, which is going to be determined exclusively by the weak acid. Then as we start to add base, strong base, we create a buffering solution, which resists pH change right up until we start to run out of buffering capacity because almost all of the weak acid has been consumed. And we reach an equivalence point determined by the weak conjugate base. In this case, notice that it's slightly above 8. And then if we keep adding in the strong base, the pH starts to go up and up and up, and then it starts to level off um, well after the equivalence point when we have an excess of hydroxide that's driving the pH above 12. So let's go through this uh, with language, then we'll go through an example. So the initial pH is that of the weak acid solution. And you can calculate that exactly like we've already done in chapter 16. Um, that's, that's not problematic for you guys at this point. Remember that before the equivalence point, the solution is going to become a buffer. So you can calculate the moles of the initial concentration of the weak acid and the moles of the initial concentration of the conjugate base using reaction stoichiometry. And you can calculate the pH in this zone using the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation using the amount of moles of the weak acid and the conjugate base to that weak acid. And then the half neutralization of this in that buffering zone is where the pH equals the pKa. At the equivalence point, as we're moving along the curve, the moles of weak acid is going to equal the moles of base. So the resulting solution is that the weak acid has been fully consumed, and we therefore only have conjugate base anion. shortcuts that you might use. You can look at this and say at the equivalence point the number of moles of conjugate base present is equal to the concentration, initial concentration of the number, or excuse me, not the concentration, the initial number of moles of weak acid because this is what we started with and we are adding base right up until the point where we get that inflection point. At that inflection point, that weak acid has been fully consumed and it has been fully converted by that base to the conjugate base. So that's just stoichiometric equivalence and a little bit of rationale. And everything that happens beyond that equivalence is determined by excess hydroxide in solution because the effect of the hydroxide on the pH is going to overwhelm the effect of the conjugate base that's in solution to the point where we're going to treat it as negligible.
So you can go straight to the concentration of hydroxide. It's going to equal the excess moles of um, hydroxide and molarity uh, pretty much straight on out from there. So initially, all weak acid, buffering zone, where we can treat this like a buffered solution. As we keep adding hydroxide, we're rolling right through that buffer. We're consuming all of the weak acid until we hit this equivalence point. And at the equivalence point, all of this weak acid is now conjugate base. And everything from here on up is going to be determined entirely by free hydroxide, which will be added in linearly from, in this case, 25 mils out. So let's solve some problems. So this is going to be a weak acid, strong base titration with three subcategories. So the setup, we have 40 milliliter sample, 0 0.100 moles per liter, HNO2. And it's being titrated with 0 0.200 moles per liter potassium hydroxide. So this isn't nitric acid, which is HNO3. This is a weaker version. So still got to treat it like a weak acid. We want to know A, the volume required to reach the equivalence point. OK. B, the pH after adding 5 milliliters of potassium hydroxide. OK. C, the pH at 1 half the equivalence point. That's going to be the pKa again. So where the pH equals pKa. So let's start with A. Part A, what we need to do to find the volume required to reach the equivalence point is find out how much acid we have in solution available to us in the weak acid because we need to fully consume it with the base. And then once we know how many moles of base are required to consume that many moles of acid, we can determine the volume if needed. So let's walk through. The equivalence point occurs when the amount in moles of base is going to equal the amount of moles of acid in solution. So let's start off with how many moles of acid do we have? Well, um, we have 40 mils of 0 0.100 moles per liter HNO2. So that's going to be 0 0.0400 liters times 0 0.100 moles per liter. Liters conveniently cancels. And that gives us 4.00 times 10 to the minus 3 moles of HNO3. That means that to reach the equivalence point, we have to have the exact same number of moles of hydroxide. So we're going to need 4.00 times 10 to the minus 3 moles of sodium, or excuse me, potassium hydroxide. So now we just need to calculate the volume of potassium hydroxide. And to do that, volume of potassium hydroxide is going to equal, for the concentration, 4. Point, excuse uh, the number of moles, 4.00 times 10 to the minus 3 moles, divided by 0 0.200 moles per liter. So notice that this is just arranged so that moles cancel, giving us liters as our final. And that gives us 0 0.0200 liters of potassium hydroxide. And if you want to take this back to milliliters, since that's what we're going to be reading off of Burette, it's going to be 20.0 milliliters of potassium hydroxide solution. So we're just actually going through some molar equivalencies. Not that different from when we started Chem 105, but the system's a little bit more complex. But it's nothing that you guys aren't fully capable of doing at this stage. B, let's see what B was. Determine the pH after adding 5 mils of potassium hydroxide. This is going to be interesting because we know now we reached the equivalent point at 20 mils. 5 mils will not get us to the equivalence point. It means we're going to be in that buffering zone. And if we're in a buffer zone, I bet we're going to be leaning on Henderson Hasselbach. Or an ice table. Or your choice of the two. So, part B. We're going to use the concentration of the potassium hydroxide solution to calculate the amount in moles of 
free hydroxide in five mils of the solution. So if we know the initial concentration, which we do, to be 5.00 uh, times 10 to the minus 3 liters times 0 0.200 moles per liter, liters cancel, that's going to give us a total of 1.00 times 10 to the minus 3 moles of hydroxide added. So going back one step, we know the concentration, 0.2 moles per liter, and we know, going down, in 5 mils, that's 0 0.00500 liters. That's where the liters are coming from. So we have the concentration, we have the volume, that can give us our number of moles, and that's what we're seeing here. So we've added 1 times 10 to the minus 3, or 0 0.001 moles of hydroxide of it titrant to our solution. So let's add a, put this in an ice table and see how much weak acid and how much conjugate base we have before doing this. So we have in our balance equation, hydroxide being added to HNO2 will give us water where the hydroxide pulls that proton off of the acid and the conjugate base NO2 minus. So initially, before we've added any hydroxide, we have functionally zero moles of hydroxide. Our initial concentration is what we start with, 4.00 times 10 to the minus 3 moles of HNO2, our weak acid. And before the reaction takes place, we don't have any conjugate base either. We're adding this known quantity in 5 mils of hydroxide, which is 1.00 times 10 to the minus 3 moles. So we're not dealing with x's here. We have known quantities. And after the addition, all of it will have been consumed because we were before the equivalence point. Every bit of it will be consumed. So it's still going to be zero. However, it's going to react, dropping the concentration of the weak acid by x amount. So our final concentration of HNO2 is going to be 3.00 times 10 to the minus third moles. And our final of the conjugate base will be equal to the amount of sodium hydroxide, or in this case, sorry, hydroxide added, 1.00 times 10 to the minus 3 moles. Now that we know this value and this value, we can plug it right into the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. pH equals pKa plus log of the concentration of base over the concentration of the acid. And we can just substitute in moles versus concentration because the volumes are equivalent and therefore factor out. So looking at this, let's just plug it in. pKa equals 3.34 for HNO2, which is given. And uh, we'll just plug and chug here and solve. So pH for this exact scenario would be 2.86. And part C. Let's see what C is asking for again. What is the pH at one half the equivalence point? Well, at one half the equivalence point, the amount of base added is exactly one half the initial amount of acid, right? Because the equivalence point is X amount of hydroxide to consume all of the acid, fully converting it into the conjugate base. Well, to get it halfway is exactly half that amount. So the base exactly converts half of the HNO2 to NO2 minus, and this results in the amounts of weak acid being equivalent to the amount of conjugate base. And when the ratio of acid to conjugate base is the same, we have equal molar concentrations of both, the pH is going to equal the pKa. So you can actually reach that one exclusively off of rationale. Oh, the pH equals the pKa. And you can do all the math if you want to, which is shown 
It's exactly like before, but it's not necessary in this particular example. Save yourself some time. So what I'd recommend, jump in here, hit pause, and try this problem out. See if you can work through that problem doing exactly the same thing um, we were just doing. So, along the same lines, there are a couple other types of titration curves you should be aware of. This one's the titration curve for a weak base with a strong asset, right? Very, very similar. If you titrate a weak base with a strong asset, you're going to get the same scenario here where you start, in this particular case, with 0.1 moles per liter of ammonia, which is our weak base. And as you add hydrochloric acid by milliliters in the titration, you're forming a buffer between the ammonia and ammonium, its conjugate acid. So we're having this buffer zone, which is resisting pH change. And at halfway to the equivalence point, which is going to be determined by the pKa, you're going to have equal molar concentrations of ammonia and ammonium, and that's going to equal the pKa uh, as well. You also have titrations of polyprotic acids. So polyprotic acids can have multiple acidic protons, and because there's multiple acidic protons, you're going to have multiple inflection points or slash equivalence points. And it's going to take a certain volume of acid to fully consume that. So let's say you have uh, H2SO3 here. That's polyprotic. There's two acidic protons. So to get the first proton fully neutralized is going to take a certain equivalent of hydroxide. And then it's going to take that same equivalent, so in this case 25 mils, and then it's going to take another 25 mils to get the second proton fully neutralized. Even though the second proton is a weaker acid, because our strong base is so, acidic, so much more basic, it's going to fully consume it. And that's where we're going to see multiple inflection points or equivalence points in this. Now, how this is done, how you get these kind of curves, um, is done by putting a pH probe into solution with a little stir bar. So there's a little magnetic stir bar zimming around in there, gently mixing it. And you have to add very slowly so that you get a measure of true pH. Otherwise, you get regions of higher pH and lower pH in solution. And you just very slowly add your base to your acid and measure the pH until you get this curve, which gives you a uh, titration curve which reflects how the pH changes as you add base to your unknown solution. Conversely, instead of monitoring it actively, you can just have endpoints that you're looking for based on color metric uh, compounds which are added to your solution. And this is going to have a bright colored endpoint. So some colored endpoints indicate neutrality. Others happen at different pHs. So in the case of thenothaline, which is one of our classic uh, indicators, thenothaline starts to change color just a little bit around 7, but doesn't really pick up until you're quite alkaline. So some dyes happen very brilliantly and very quickly. And other color metric dyes and indicators are very challenging to read. When I was working in an environmental lab in the late 90s, as a backup, we did a lot of color metric titrations when equipment broke. And looking at different dissolved ions. And there was one in particular where the actual standard operating procedure was to look for a light green to turn to a slightly darker light green. So we 
did it three times independently, we tried to zero in on it, and then we had to bring in a, another person with an objective eyeball that hasn't been watching it over and over and over to see if they agreed with it. It was a very um, challenging endpoint to determine. So these can have varied degrees of value, but they're classics. And this is an example of all of the different possible, not all of, but many of the possible different acid base indicators and the pH range at which they change colors and the colors at which they shift at those pHs. So um, this is obviously not something you're going to have to memorize. But just to give you an idea of the diversity of different acid base indicators and their colors and the ranges that they cover. But you can see that we have acid base indicators that cover everything from pH 0 to pH 12. Pretty slick. With uh, the phenolphthalein down here being not particularly intense compared to many of the others, but it's still commonly, commonly used. So let's change gears a little bit away from titrations, start talking about solubility equilibria. Uh, wrap it up. I think we have about 10 slides left, and then we're, we're done for chapter 18 here. So first off, all ionic compounds dissolve in water to some degree. I know in Chem 105, we classified compounds in bulk as soluble or insoluble. But one of the beauties of 106 is we get to start talking about how soluble or how insoluble, right? How do we influence those solubilities? I love adding all the different levels of shades of gray to the chemistry. Was it reactive or not reactive? Well, how reactive? How unreactive? Where's the equilibrium lie? Far to the left, far to the right? How can we influence it? So this is another example of uh, adding layers of complexity to things that we talked about in 105. So despite them all being soluble to some degree, many compounds have such low solubility in water, we just inherently classify them as insoluble. Um, so despite that fact, you know, you don't have to say, oh, well, now I know everything's kind of soluble. It doesn't mean it's actually soluble. It means it's barely soluble, and functionally we can still refer to it as insoluble. So you still have to know your solubility tables to do it fast. We can apply the concepts of equilibriums, uh, equilibrium of salts dissolving and uh, use these equilibrium constants for the process of measuring relative, solubil relative solubility in water. So let's take a look at what we're talking about here. So this is called the solubility product, or KSP. So we have all these different Ks, right? And you've, at this point, probably started to get the idea of what K is an indicator of. K, remember, is an equilibrium constant, which describes what's happening on the product side of the reaction over what's happening on the reactant side of the reaction. And the same is here. So we introduced K, and then we had Ka for acid-base dissociation, and now we have Ksp, which we can call solubility product, but I just usually typically call it KSP. And what we're going to look at here initially is let's just use um, the dissociation of silver chloride. So silver chloride is our ionic salt, and it's going to be in equilibrium in solution when we put it into water with uh, silver cation, aqueous, and aqueous chloride. Now, solids do not get included in equilibrium expressions. So there's nothing over here on the reactant side that's going to be included in the equilibrium expression. So the equilibrium expression, or KSP, for this solubility reaction is going to be exclusively defined by the ions as the products. So KSP in this particular case is going to equal the concentration of our silver cation raised to its respective power, which is 1, times the concentration of the chloride raised to its respective power, which is also 1. Notice we don't have any powers here, but if we did, we'd have to be plugging them in up here. Um, but we don't have them, so we don't have to worry about that 
quite yet. And what this tells us is how favored a salt is for dissociating into its ions. And this is just a list of solubility products of a handful of different salts. So we have barium fluoride, barium sulfate, barium carbonate, um, calcium fluoride, calcium hydroxide, etc. And all the way down. And you can see these values are all over the place. Minus 5, minus 10, minus 9, minus 36 for copper 2 sulfide. Um, there's a large range of different propensities for dissolving the salts in solution. So what's this mean in terms of molar solubility? Well, remember, <laughs> solubility is the amount of solute that will dissolve in a given amount of solution at a particular temperature. So these are also temperature dependent. So the molar solubility is the number of moles of solute that will dissolve in a liter of solution. What's the maximum amount that something in terms of moles of something that will dissolve in a liter of solution at a given temperature? This could also be thought of as the molarity of the dissolved solute in a saturated solution when you can't get any more into it. So, KSP and relative solubility. So how are molar solubility related to KSP? Um, it is related, but you can't always compare solubility of compounds by comparing the KSP values. Um, so to compare KSP values, the compounds have to be the same dissociation stoichiometry because you're raising things to different powers based on um, the concentrations. So if you have... Um, values here. That's going to cause exponents here and that's going to change how the concentrations are expressed. So molar solubility doesn't line up perfectly with KSP, um, but you can use them in conjunction with one another to describe a system. So Let's talk a little bit about the effect of common ions on solubility. So the addition of a soluble salt that contains one of the ions of an insoluble salt is going to decrease the solubility of that insoluble salt. What's that mean? A um, good example, let's take a look at uh, if we added sodium fluoride to solution of calcium fluoride. Um, what that's going to do is decrease the solubility. Uh, so let's take a look at this. If we have a sol solid calcium fluoride, it's going to partially dissolve when you put it in water into one calcium and two fluorides, right? So if we were to add sodium fluoride, which fully dissociates because sodium um, fully dissociates, it's going to be just adding fluorines to solution. By Le Chatelier's principle, if we're adding more fluorine to solution, we have to drive the equilibrium back towards our reactant. What this would functionally mean is that less of the calcium fluoride would be able to dissociate spontaneously as we add more fluoride from other sources into the solution. So that's what we're talking about at the beginning here, is the addition of these components from soluble salts can decrease the solubility of the insoluble salt. So this would be one way we could drive things out of solution if we were interested in doing so, for isolating calcium from solution, for instance. Now let's talk a, lot, a little bit about how pH can be uh, can affect solubility. So for certain salts, pH can dramatically affect solubility. Uh, for insoluble ionic hydroxides, like magnesium hydroxide, if you start to, the higher the pH, the lower the solubility of the ionic hydroxide, right? And this makes sense because if you start to increase the pH 
means the solution is going to have higher concentration of hydroxide in solution. As we increase the amount of hydroxide in solution, that's going to drive the reaction back towards reactants, which is going to make the magnesium hydroxide functionally less soluble than it was before, lowering the solubility of the magnesium hydroxide. For insoluble ionic compounds that contain anions of weak acids, the lower the pH, the higher the solubility. So what's that look like? Well, here we have solid, solid calcium carbonate. And it, to a limited extent, dissociates to one calcium and one carbonate, because both are, have uh, plus two and a minus two charge. Now, the carbonate can react with acid just fine forming carbonic acid and water. So if we add acid to the solution, it effectively pulls the carbonate out of solution. And what's that, what that's going to do is pull the reaction over towards products, which is going to increase the dissolution of the calcium carbonate. Which is probably why you have cleaned calcium carbonate from a coffee pot or other fixtures using vinegar because that vinegar is an acid and it's grabbing that carbonate, converting it to carbonic acid, which is aqueous, and pulling the calcium carbonate into solution and letting you uh, clean your coffee pot so it's not all clogged up anymore. For those of you who live in zones with um, hard water, at least. I'm on a well and I get calcium carbonate built up on all my water fixtures because of that. But a little, little vinegar goes a long way. And so finally, last couple slides. You'll note the chapter gives you some other content that I'm not addressing in these lectures. It's because I'm not going to evaluate you on those because I don't feel, I feel it's beyond the scope of what I want you guys to focus on. We have so much time available to learn certain things. So I'm triaging and identifying where I want you to put your time. And I don't want you to learn archaic wet lab techniques for sorting through unknown compounds and solution. Using that as a proof of principle in a lab, uh, academic lab is fine, but there's a time and place for it. And I'd much rather you spend your energy on where these slides are. So please focus on uh, this content and you can take it to heart that if it's not in the slides and it's not being presented in the homework, I'm not going to be evaluating you on that particular content. So don't distress if you think that a section or two is missing. It's uh, intentional. That said, moving on to precipitation. So we're talking about solubility and insolubility. Precipitation is taking something that's soluble and making it insoluble so that it will leave the solution so you can separate it from solution. So precipitation is going to occur whenever a concentration of an ion exceeds its solubility for that particular compound. Uh, we can change that solubility uh, at our whim occasionally, depending on what the system is. So if we just compare the reaction quotient Q for the current solution concentrations to the value of the KSP, we can determine quickly if there should be a precipitation. So if the reaction quotient Q is equal to KSP, the solution is saturated. You have as much of it in solution as it can hold. But if Q is lower than KSP, the solution is um, unsaturated, meaning there's room for more. And if Q is greater than KSP, that would predict that the solution is above saturation and you should be able to initiate a precipitation event. So there are exceptions to that, and you guys have probably seen examples of it where Q is greater than KSP, um, but nothing is precipitating yet, and that's because of supersaturation. And sometimes you just need to cause a precipitation event where you add a starter crystal or you tap on a glass or something like that. But a good example would be 
um, boiling, saturating a boiling solution of salt, and then letting it cool very, very slowly without agitating the solution. And it will unstably hold more salt in that water at room temperature than it would otherwise. But if you put a couple little starter crystals of salt into the solution, it will rapidly precipitate out because um, it's not stably supersaturated, it's unstably su supersaturated. Oh look, and here's an example of something like that happening. Um, so these are different precipitation events. And this would be a really good example of a supersaturated solution where you have supersaturated sodium acetate and you have a little seed crystal of acetate that you drop in and you get explosive crystal formation as everything that is above the degree of saturation for that solution comes crashing out, reforming crystals. So let's see here. Selective precipitation. A solution containing several different cations can often be separated using different reagents that will form insoluble salts with one of the ions but not the other. And this really leans back on the content we learned in 105 with our solubility tables. Uh, they're not really that selective though because they happen in classes. So a successful reagent, you can precipitate more than one of the cations as long as their KSP values are very different. Um, so there, this is actually getting slowly into uh, some of the wet lab stuff I intentionally omitted. So uh, this is more, delete, more just informative. And then a quick example of this. Um, a solution contains equal concentrations of barium, lead, and calcium ions. When potassium sulfate is added to solution, which cations precipitate first? Of course, I didn't include the table in here. Um, however, sulfates form precipitations uh, with barium preferably. So this is a terrible example. I apologize because um, I didn't include the table here for, to rationalize it. Um, to some extent, remember these last three slides, four slides even, are mostly just informative and uh, some proof of concept things, but I'm not going to be quizzing you on selective precipitation. Um, I don't think it's worth your High, I don't think it's high value for your time invested compared to the other topics and the problem solving that we spent most of the last two hours on over uh, the last this lecture and the previous lecture. So please focus on the material presented, get on top of that homework, and uh, that's it for chapter 18 in aqueous ionic equilibrium. All right, thank you very much.